Okay there, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome uh, to this talk on date and time, JSR 310. Um, so I'm Stephen Colborn, uh, Roger Riggs is over here, he'll be speaking a little bit later. Um, so obviously what we're here to talk about today is this picture, in my view. It's the incredible disappearing complicatedness of actually getting a date and time API that's suitable. Um, it seems like such a simple problem, but it isn't. It's a complicated problem space. There are, you know, it's, it's one that if I asked you, you know, in the audience, you know, what's the date and time, you can just look at your watch. But there's a lot of stuff that goes into figuring out what the time is. Um, and that solution is in Java is hard. So JSR 310 is intending to be a new date and time library um, for the JDK. And obviously there are interesting design constraints around being in the JDK. And uh, it's kind of inspired by Joda time. So for those of you who haven't used Joda time, uh, go and use it. Um, you know, it's the best thing that's available in JDK 6 and JDK 7, um, and better than Java Util Date and Calendar. Um, so if you've used Joda time, then much of JSR 310 is fairly familiar. Um, 310 is an open JSR project. So whilst there's been much openness and transparency in the JS JCP recently, um, JSR 310 has kind of been doing it that way all along. So, you know, it's there's a BSD license code, um, it's open mailing list, it's on GitHub, um, easy to deal with basically. So here's a little timeline as how things have gone along. It's a long time ago since the JSI was approved. Um, we had an early draft review back in 2010, and we're actually in a second early draft review now, um, coming up towards the um, feature complete date there of January 2013. Now, you know, you could say that's a long timeline. It is a long timeline. But, you know, there's no point in putting something into the JDK that's broken. Once it's in the JDK, it's fixed. We already have two, let's say, broken JDK APIs in date and time. We can't afford to put a third core one in there. So we need to make sure we get it right. So what are the overall goals of the JSR? Well, we're trying to find this comprehensive model for date and time. Um, we need to support global calendar systems. Um, and we want an element of type safety. So where it's sensible to avoid primitives, um, we want to do that. I mean, you know, day of the week of six doesn't really mean a lot. Whereas a day of week as an enum, uh, you know, where the enum is something sensible like Thursday, that makes sense. So there should be an element of sort of self-documentation about it. It should be easy for you to, you know, once you've written your code, it should be easy to know what that code means, and it should be IDE friendly. Um, we always use IDEs these days. Obviously, we have to interoperate, and XML and database are big users of date and time stuff. So these are sort of the principles we set out way back when. Um, we want things to be immutable. Um, you know, part of the big problem with date and calendar class today, they're mutable, so, you know, if you receive them in a Java bean, you have to clone them. Um, if you're passing them between threads, you're not sure what you're getting. Um, it's far better for us to have immutable classes. That's really what's really required here. Um, we want the thing to be fluent, so you can basically read what the date and time says. Um, perhaps a key one is this clear, explicit, and expected. These methods should be well-defined. If you call a method, you know, it, you need to know what it's going to do. There shouldn't be too much ambiguity in terms of what that method call is going to do. And this results in quite a strong control over state. So you have to control what the state of the individual classes are in order to be able to define very clearly what the methods do. Uh, there'll be an example of that later, I think. Um, and we, you know, JDK authors, JSR authors, we're, you know, there's many different ways you can work with dates and times. You know, we can't know everything, so we need an element of extensibility. In this. this just gives an idea as to sort of some of the different concepts that there are out there in dates and times. Um, you know, people talk about rubber seconds or um, Julian calendar systems, um, SI units. There's many, many different aspects to date and time. These it can easily, you can easily get lost in the number of which different ways that the word time can get overloaded. So time itself just has so many meanings. Um, so what we're trying to do, part of the, what the JSR is trying to do is define a domain language for dates and times. So that if people talk about you know, this particular word, we know what they're meaning and it's, 
It's, it's like design patterns. You know, if somebody talked to you about a factory pattern or an adapter pattern, we pretty much know what it was because those have kind of imbued themselves into our lives. And so it's the same here. We're trying to add in a level of information by using words and consistent language within the date and time domain. Now, it might not become immediately apparent as to why that's necessary, but once you've used, if you've used Joda Time, you actually find yourself talking in terms of the class names as the concept you're trying to represent. So you end up modeling using those class names as your concepts. So it ends up, kind of the analysis did, you end up with these sort of two core requirements. So you have machine time and human time. So the one on the left is a cesium clock. So that's the atomic clock that actually you know, counts the true length of a second in terms of the number of permutations of a cesium atom. So that's what one of those looks like. Um, so the continuous stuff, that's single incrementing number. You know, it's great for machines. Machines are great at just counting incrementing numbers. You know, we know this in Java Util date where you just store a number of milliseconds from 1970. Um, whereas humans, we like to deal with something sensible we can grab hold of. So we deal with years, months, days, hours, minutes, seconds. And so there's obviously a relationship between these two things, but they are different. So the timeline itself, well, that's just a fundamental part of human experience. Um, there's no particular model for class to represent that in the API. But the first class we do have is instant. So instant is just an instantaneous point on that timeline. So you've got a time, time stamp of an event, um, kind of equivalent to what you might use Java Util date for just to represent a point in time with no ability to get hold of years, months, days, that kind of stuff out of it. You can convert it to other classes to get the years, months, days out, but you can't get them out directly. So we're measuring it using nanoseconds. Um, there's a requirement, certainly from the database side, to store nanoseconds. Um, unfortunately, this gives us a problem because you need 96 bits to store enough information, and there's no primitive in Java with 96 bits. So we have to work around this. We have to store seconds in a long and nanoseconds in an int and combine those two things, lots of maths. So duration. Again, these are concepts which are probably quite common and quite understandable, but we have to give them names. You know, once we give them a name, everybody within your team can communicate using these names. So duration is an amount of time, it's a quantity. Um, so it's not connected to timeline, but it, it is, it is a, in, in the particular model we're using, it's a directed difference, so it points forwards. So you can have negative durations if that's what makes sense in your application. Again, it makes, it's measured in nanoseconds, and again, obviously we need that 96 bits. So here's some example code. Um, so here we're creating an instant from a number of milliseconds. Um, second line, an instant of now. So that's going away using the system clock, system current time millis internally. Um, but there's expansion on that, which we'll cover later on. Um, nice convenient method to check whether it's before or after. We can get hold of duration in a similar way. Obviously, duration being an amount, we can multiply that by things, we can divide that by things, we can add it. Um, and then we can combine these two things together. So again, you're beginning to see that the code there just kind of reads fairly naturally. There's nothing overly complicated about that. But, we have weird things in dates and times. <laughs> you know, there is such a time as 2359.60. So in real life, um, the length of the SI second, so SI is system international, I think, um, it's the scientific definition of a second. So that cesium clock we saw a picture of earlier, that defines the length of a second in terms of an atom-based system. So that's absolutely fixed, it doesn't change. But the length of the day does vary. You know, astronomers look up at the sky and they tell us how long a day is. And the Earth is slowing down. That's what they tell us. So since the length of the day changes, but the length of a second doesn't change, we have a bit of a problem. And so the problem is that the day isn't equal to the total of all of that information. So UTC, which is the clock we all deal with, they insert leap seconds to create this. Now, probably the average member of the general public doesn't really notice leap seconds. Um, computers don't handle leap seconds very well. They only happen occasionally. There was five or six years without any leap seconds. They generally happen once every 18 months, that kind of thing. 
So Java counts milliseconds from 1970, um, but what does this mean? Well, the strange thing is that the UTC definition I was just talking about only began in 1972. So 1970 isn't a terribly great date to choose as your definition of a fixed point in time. Um, and the definition of Java milliseconds assumes this number of 86400 seconds per day. So what happens around leap seconds? So there's no happy answer to this. <laughs> Well, basically, when, when I say it only started properly, the scientists defined what UTC meant in 1972. Now, they actually defined it before 1972, but the definition before 1972 was even weirder. They added in tenths of seconds and seconds that weren't a second long. <laughs> Trust me, you don't want to know before 1972, that's even worse. So we've taken an approach. So we're defining a Java timescale. Um, and on our time scale, so midday is always the same as midday on a UTC type time scale, the civil time scale. Now, I'm saying civil time, not UTC there, because if somebody in the future redefines what UTC is, or the world decides that UTC is not is no longer the most commonly used time scale in the world, this doesn't this definition doesn't change. We're just talking about the most commonly used civil time scale in the world. Um, other times have to match within the day as best as possible. So we're defining in Java that a day is divided up into 86400 subdivisions, which we're calling seconds. Now, what that means is a second in Java is not always the same length as a second as defined by the scientists. But, you know, most of the time that's what developers actually want. If you actually go and look, there's a Google article online which basically says how they smooth over leap seconds to make sure there's always 86400 seconds per day. So Google's second is not the same as a scientific second. Um, and that's what a lot of operating systems try and do as well. So this definition is not unheard of or unreasonable. It's just a practical definition that means developers can ignore leap seconds because we don't really want to know most of the time. So human scale date and time, obviously that's what most of us are interacting with all the time. Years, months, days, hours, minutes, seconds. Um, times 24 hours, seven day weeks, all this kind of stuff. So what we need to be able to represent in our applications is the concept of a date and a time or a date on its own or a time on its own. Um, offsets from Greenwich. So I'm gonna go into these in a bit more detail. So a local date. So a local date is a reference to a time, to a date, without any reference to any times or time zones. So you know, my birthday might have been the 1st of April 1900. I don't need to specify that I was born in, you know, London. I don't need to specify what time of day I was born. I'm just specifying the date. Um, and that's great. So now we have a class that we can just store that information in. And that actually turns, to, turns out to be one of the things we most commonly want to do in our applications. Now, if you're still using Java Util Calendar, what you're probably doing is setting all the time fields to zero if you want to represent a date. Now, unfortunately, that actually doesn't work because once a year in certain countries, um, there's a time zone gap where midnight to one o'clock in the morning doesn't exist. So if you're trying to set your time to midnight, zero, 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 you're setting it to a time that doesn't exist and you'll get errors. <laughs> Having a class that only represents the date on its own means you don't get that kind of error. We have a local time class. Yeah. By analogy, it just represents the time. Yeah. When does a shop open? It's time shown on an alarm clock, time shown on your mobile phone. Um, Java class associated with this, again, it just stores the time. And it stores it down to nanosecond again, but you can use it in effect for just hour a minute or more than that. Then we combine these two classes together. So we have a local date time class. Yeah, the date and time a flight takes off. You normally talk about that in terms of a, a local time. And then we have the concept of zone offset. So over here, we're like eight hours or nine hours behind. <laughs> Is it eight or is it seven? I, I lose track. I'm behind of Greenwich. Um, in London, we're either at Greenwich time or we're one hour ahead of Greenwich time. So, you know, Australia's ahead, USA's behind, 
this is a concept which you'll, you'll, you'll see as this plus 18, uh, plus 01 colon 00. And this is perhaps what you, know, you might actually be using that offset with, so you have the offset date time. So this is the date and time combined with an offset. So if you actually want to specify a point in time, then you know, here's a way of doing it. So if you remember back, we had the instant class. The instant class was a point on the timeline that had no information about human scaling um, time. You couldn't find the year, the month, the day out of it. Whereas an offset date time represents exactly the same point on the timeline, but because we've got the offset in there, we can actually now define what the year, month, day, hour, minute, second is. So that extra piece of information allows us to convert the overall instant to a date and time. <coughs> and there's other classes. So if you just want to represent a year, you can do that, or a year and a month for a credit card expiry date, perhaps. Um, if you just want to represent a month and day, apparently the Brazilians don't like giving their birth date, birth years, so they just give you your, the, the month and day. Um, day of week, month on their own. So you have a nice enum to represent, you know, whether it's April or September. An enum to represent whether it's Tuesday or Wednesday. And other combinations as well. Some code. So we can query date and time using standard kind of get methods, um, just returning whatever the best type is for the field, a primitive int for most fields, an enum if it makes sense. You know, as I said earlier, day week equals six doesn't mean much, day week dot Saturday does. Now we have to look at what happens when we're immutable. So if we're immutable, you can't have set methods. Set doesn't make any sense for immutable classes. So instead we have with methods. So you don't change the original object, you return a, a new method. So if, you, if you've not used this kind of thing before, string dot to local case, to lower case is an example of that kind of thing. So here we have an example of creating a local date, and you know, 3rd of December 2010, setting the year. So we just do with year, 2011. So that's like calling set year 2011, but we're returning a new object, so it's with year. But there are more complicated ways to adjust dates and times than that. So we have this adjuster interface. What this allows us to do is pre-package up logic for changing dates and times. So you can say date dot with the last day of the month, or a date dot with the next third Friday of the month, or last Wednesday of the month. So these are the kind of algorithms that when you're working with dates and times in your applications, those are the actual useful algorithms. You know, the basics of just changing a year or a month or a day, they're quite boring ones. Changing it to the last Friday in a month, that's the more complicated one. You know, changing it to the next um, non-weekend day, that's the kind of algorithm you want to be pre-packaging up. So some of these prepackaged things will be provided by the JDK and some of them won't. And then we have the problem of time zones. Time zones are a problem. They definitely are. So the world is divided up into time zones. These are political things. Political things means government, means power, means control over people. Um, you know, people change their life savings time rapidly with a few days notice over a number of years as experiments, maybe every year. Um, you, know, you can't assume there's only one daylight savings time period a year. You know, um, places in the Middle East typically have daylight saving time and then come out of daylight saving time for Ramadan and then go back into daylight saving time again. These things get complicated. There's not much you can assume about it. So then you have these rules which define how that offset changes. So you've obviously got to have somebody who gathers together all the information from all the governments. And, figure, and provides that information in some kind of database. So it turns out there's multiple groups who pull the information together from databases. So the big one is the time zone database group, which is now with IANA, um, but also Windows does the job. IATA for travel industry does the job. Various commercial companies do the job. Um, and so each group probably defines its own ID. So the time zone database, it's Europe slash London. So if you ever, you ever use time zones in Java, you're actually using the time zone database, um, which is the same one that's used in all the Unix stuff as well. Um, 
If you have a look at what the JDK does, it has this class time zone, and this says it represents the time zone offset and also figures out daylight savings. So this is an example of where the Java doc is kind of telling you this class is doing two things. So what we're doing here is separating out the responsibility into two separate classes. So you have the, the zone offset, which is just the offset it's on its own. Then you have the rules, which are the rules for how and when it switches offsets. And then you have the zone ID, which names a set of rules. So you have to break the concepts up into different parts. But you only end up with this one additional time zone class, zone date time. So zone date time, if you use Java Util Calendar, you could argue that's the equivalent because it's the one that actually stores a date, a time, and the time zone to interact with. Now, you know, that's not me saying replace all Java Util Calendar with zone date time because that's not usually what you want to do. You want to look at your code and say, well, actually, was I using calendar just to represent a date on its own? If so, then I should use local date there. If I was using it just to represent a time of day, then I should actually switch to using local time. So it's not a case of you should just swap from one to another. You have to think about it. And then we have the problem of, well, what happens with those lovely gaps and overlaps in daylight saving time? So obviously in spring, you know, there's a bit of the, there's, a, there's an hour which doesn't happen. In the autumn, this, the same hour happens twice. So we have a, a strategy pattern which allows those things to be um, defined and controlled. We can ask the API to find out what the situation is. So we can say, you know, for this given local date and time, is time changing? Is it in the middle of a gap? Is it in the middle of an overlap? And do certain business logic around that. And there's a summary of where all the different classes sit. So we have local date, local time, local date time. They just build up on this local timeline. So there's no information about time zones or offset there. Then we add in the information about the offset. And then only at the end do we add in the information about the um, time zone. So it builds up step by step. So what this means is that when you're doing your writing your code, you should actually be choosing which one of these classes represents the information best that you should be storing in this variable. So it, it's adding to the data modeling ability of your API. But it requires obviously therefore extra, a little bit of extra thought to make sure you're using the right concept rather than the wrong concept. Roger? Thanks, Stephen. Uh, so all the support in the uh, classes that uh, Stephen has been talking about represent sort of the core ISO API, and it's in one of the packages of, of the, the 310 API. There's quite a bit of other support there. Uh, one topic is how we're going to integrate the 310 classes into the, into the JDK so that it's possible to transfer, uh, to convert Java calendar and dates to 310 APIs and back when necessary, when you have to go between sort of existing code and new code. Uh, so the, the technique will actually add some of the interfaces of, from 310 into Java Util Calendar to make the, the sort of the normal operations within 310 be able to convert and exchange uh, dates and times. Uh, plan, current plan is to not have any, not to have Java Util Calendar or dates show up in the 310 API. It's sort of a bit of pollution. You get to choose which way it works. Um, it seems good to keep the 310 API clean. The, uh, so just as Stephen said, all of the, the core classes are based on the ISO standard and some fairly, fairly straightforward uh, constants and definitions. 310 also has to take into account uh, sort of the other places that represent time in XML and in, in databases, and uh, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, so in databases, there are you know, some well-defined, in, in JDBC it and the SKL standard, it defines similar concepts of uh, dates times without time zones, times, uh, timestamps without time zones, et cetera, various combinations. And there's a straightforward mapping from the, the SQL concepts of date and time to the, the 310 uh, types that are represented. Uh, there are, uh, on the time zone issue, there are, I guess the, the standard basically says what happens, that all dates and times are represented as potentially having offsets, but there's no really support for time zones in the standard. However, there are many proprietary databases that have X, SQL extensions or database extensions to deal with that. So we're going to work on how that, those translations will work uh, to support uh, 
SQL well. The other, another aspect which Stephen mentioned is the, the idea of a period, sort of a, a, it's not the same as duration, and duration is really sort of a very fixed amount of time, but durations are measured more in terms of the, the units of human time, like year and months, days, uh, and the, the difference really shows up only in a few places when there are time zone differences or uh, daylight saving time changes where you're not really representing a length of time, but between the point distance between two clock readings. You know, they look at the clock twice and it has a certain difference. So the period class will be able to represent these differences in terms of you know, the number of years, months, days, hours, minutes, seconds, and nanoseconds. Um, and those periods can be added or subtracted to the time and date classes. Um, but you get some interesting artifacts that we have to figure out the details of. If you add a day to uh, January 2031st, or actually if you add a day in a month to January 31st, what do you get to? Is it March or is it February? So there's some interesting problems, and this is, you know, Stephen alluded to these little pitfalls all over the API. The other aspect which uh, we also need to cover in the 310 APIs is support for other calendar systems. There's, you know, besides the, the, the core case of 8601 and the ISO calendars, there are many other ca historical calendars and calendars in common use uh, around the world. And the, the goal is to try to make the API um, so that we can support both well, but not really, not really sort of contaminate or uh, make the ISO API less clear and less useful. Uh, and as always, we need to make sure that there's no ambiguity and developers, uh, that API will help developers write good code. Uh, so there's a lot of different calendars. Uh, the API needs to be able to do some lookup by names. One of the concepts that we've, we're still working on is the concept of a calendar neutral API where the calendar system is a parameter to the API. So that you can write code that manipulates um, and does calculations in the calendars without actually knowing which calendar you're in. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to say you can add a day. Sometimes it's pretty straightforward to add a month, add a year. Um, but the actual computation and what the date ends up being when you do those operations depends a lot on what calendar you're in. And so there's a, the notion of a chronology or a calendar system that has to be taken into account that's not as fixed as the one in ISO. Uh, there are many oddities in calendars, you know, and I guess in traditional Chinese, there can be an extra month inserted between any two months in a 12-month calendar. And there are calendars in which sometimes there are 12 months and sometimes there's 13. Um, so the API for that needs to keep the, the developer from making assumptions about, you know, the number of months in, in a particular year. Um, the current API that is in the EDR uh, is focused just on the date concept. There's no, unlike ISO, there's no way to represent a date and a time or a date time and an offset or uh, zone date time. Um, but they all are uh, convertible to the ISO time. So uh, it is this chronology package, which is separate from the main ISO package, has factory, this is a chronology class which represents the things, that the parameters that are specific to a particular calendar, um, allows conversions in and out of uh, this concept of epoch day going back to the 1970 date where in order to be able to convert the things, everybody, you know, there has to be a common understanding of where some date appears in every, and time appears in every calendar. Um, and then just fairly straightforward methods about, uh, including mentioning of eras, there are in the, uh, many of the calendars that have at least two eras, like AD and BC in the Gregorian calendar. Japanese calendars have, you know, uh, era, number of errors to, a new era begins uh, when, when the emperor dies. So there have been a long series of, of uh, eras. And if you represent things natively in the Japanese calendar, you have to take into account that it's an offset from the beginning of the era, uh, and you have to know the era name. So there's it's sort of an additional concept in the regional calendars that is not present in, era, in uh, ISO. But most of the same operations work in adding getting the day of the weeks. I mean, we've sort of settled on the fact that the day of the week really is the same the world around. Uh, some places, the, this week starts on a different day, but to be consistent within the API, you need a fairly constant, fairly stable set of how to indicate days of the week. Um, adding and subtracting days before and after, you know, all of those common concepts uh, really do work across all the calendars. The actual computations are a little bit different, but the developer can use this sort of this aggregate uh, behavior. <coughs> 
Um, well, in general, the, the API has to be, we have to be able to support new calendars because we're not going to prevent, uh, provide all of them. Um, so it is a goal that, like with many of the other aspects, that to be extensible in adding uh, new calendars. Right, so uh, about the world calendar, I don't think I've heard about that one. I, my understanding is ISO covers all of those, those same constraints, but I haven't heard of one created by the UN, so I'll have to find out more about that. <laughs> um, just like with the ISO calendars, there's still a need to be able to do date adjustments because there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of more interesting dates if you can have a more comp interesting computation of, uh, of how to change from one date to another. And so the same date adjuster mechanism works with the, the we call the chrono or the chrono calendars. Um, shifting on a, a bit to questions about well, what's the current time, right? Uh, the, the, a lot of the current classes you just sort of say, you know, get me a, a date and it'll tell you some time. But it's sort of implicit what the time zone is that comes with that. So the, uh, the design for in 310 for the current time is built on the notion of a clock object. And there are system default cloud objects that clock objects that come with a time zone and a current time. And many of the APIs can, all the APIs can build from a clock. Um, but the, it, the result of there being a clock object is you can actually supply your own clock, either to be able to modify, you know, do things when you're testing, or to have some better, different control over time. Um, there are certain places where you want to emulate and change things, make things run faster or slower. Uh, so for example, here there's, uh, there is, there's an API called, it's typically called the method called now pretty much everywhere that uh, gives you uh, access to the current time either from the system clock um, or uh, from uh, application specific clock and it works in two ways I mean so Stephen mentioned that there were instants which really represent a point in time uh, sort of independent of a calendar and you can get that from the clock uh, or create one from, from a clock and similarly you can create the local date you know get a, a date or a time from the clocks um, as in the same way, you know, when you use, uh, you can create zone date time from the clock as well and resync re a particular date time value to a particular time zone. The, one of the uses of the clock interface is to be able to, in, in frameworks that can do injection, uh, you can, those, in those frameworks, you could actually have the clock, particular clock value be provided from outside and the developer wouldn't actually be writing to a specific, the code to provide the real clocks, but you can parameterize the whole, your whole application that way in, in, if you're using one of those other frameworks. Another one of the sub packages of 310 is support for uh, formatting and parsing. It's uh, driven, it's unlike uh, simple date format, it doesn't have a, a mutable context that goes with it, so like the rest of the API, it's built on uh, immutable objects and is safe for multi-threading. The, the, the main class is date time formatter and it's built on the fields that exist in many of the objects. I mean, one of the subsystems of, of 310 uh, has specific support for each identified field type. You know, the hour, minute, seconds, uh, AM, PM, clock of AM, PM. Uh, and this is one of the aspects, one of the dimensions of, of extensibility is this, this identification of the definition of fields. The, film, the formatter is built on the fields and how to format those fields in, in format strings. Um, the most common part of the API is, is format strings, the same way they're used in, in simple date and many of the same letters. And it's also their extensions to be built on top of the uh, CLDR standard for formatting uh, syntax and semantics. So uh, underneath sort of the high level APIs that we've been talking about, there are two, two core interfaces that provide sort of a base substrate that all of this stuff is built on. Uh, date and time, the, the date time interface, is it has a model of all of the objects that have, each has fields and you can get fields and you can, uh, you can say, sit, quote, set, but it's really the methods are called with and it returns a new object. Um, so, and that's one of the primary, this API is primary, gives, uh, access to all of the details of a particular date time object and it's one of the sort of the primary way that you can do conversion between objects. Most of the date time objects if they have a date 
also support a field called Epoch Day, which is you know, the number of days from 1970, and that's sort of a lingua franca from across all the calendars and all the components. The other interface at this, at this core level is the adjustable date time interface, and it delegates to the, to the field, the extensible field system, the ability to add and subtract from fields. So that you can add one to the seconds field of some object, and it will give you back the new object that has that field set. So as, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, there's a lot of extensibility in the API uh, at the field level and at the, for periods. Uh, the, in the period system, there's obviously, you can have periods of hours, minutes, days, years, seconds, uh, and there's potential to be able to add new period types. And the mechanism, all the mechanisms that compute periods will can delegate to, to new classes there. And then the primary one I mentioned is the date time field is the abstraction of the fields within the state time interface. And there's quite a number of predefined fields for all the standard things, but you, you can add your own uh, as needed. So as the question was earlier, it is possible to write your own calendar system. The, uh, you created an, an implementation of this chronology class and an implementation of the chrono date class, which is sort of the general, the general purpose interface. Um, the, it's currently defined, we're gonna be able to hook into the service loader mechanism in the Java runtime so that it's easy to hook new, uh, new calendar systems into the JDK just by including them in your jar file with the right amount of data. Uh, and that same mechanism will extend, uh, the service loader mechanism is used both in the, in the current JDK and in several past ones and will be adapted for use in JDK 9 with the module system. So shifting topics a bit to sort of where we are and uh, what do we have to do next. Uh, there's a sort of a, a set of open issues. We're looking at sort of where we are in the schedule and what needs to be done. Uh, we've got some key questions just kind of reevaluating the current APIs about the relationship between the regional calendars and the ISO calendars um, and how much support should be in the, in the regional calendar APIs to make them usable. Uh, we'll get to some questions about that later. The size of the APIs was, at some point, was a concern, but it's gotten a lot better, and um, it's sort of a question of how it has to fit into the JDK. There are a few questions there. Uh, one of the things we haven't looked at closely is whether there's any potential for integration with Java 8 language features. There's a potential to use default methods and maybe some Lambda features, um, but we haven't really gotten to that point. Uh, I think mostly we have the details of periods settled to support SQL, but we've got to finalize that. Um, there's sort of a bunch of detailed issues around formatting of um, regional calendar and date and time things to match, uh, to be consistent between what the JDK does today and what CLDR, st the CLDR standard for formatting suggests. Um, and we have to implement a bunch of calendars which we don't have, which we haven't yet implemented. Some of them are easier than others, um, so there's more to do there. So next step-wise, obviously we need to address a bunch of the uh, design issues. The 310 has been, is, is implemented in, the, in GitHub in the standalone uh, open source project. One of the steps in integration into the, into the JDK is getting it into, the, into a, an open JDK 310 project so we can build it with the JDK and take advantage of the the other features that are coming into the JDK at the same time. Uh, today the API is built, uh, I think it was originally built in JDK 6 and until recently, um, didn't take advantage of anything in JDK 7, um, but we're moving the syntax at least up to JDK 7 in the open source repository. So the other thing we have to be, keep a real close eye on is the schedule. Um, the JDK you know, has posted their schedule and. We mentioned this date in, at the end of January, which is milestone six in JDK, where they, they call it feature complete. And in order to synchronize with that schedule, uh, well, we have to synchronize that schedule sort of one way or another. So there's obviously more implementation to do, more testing to do, um, and you know, get it reviewed uh, so we, we have confidence in the API. So I think in summary, uh, we've got a very robust, very complete API uh, that deals with different concepts very cleanly in terms of instance and durations, very robust capability for date and time, period, 
a very complete formatting and parsing mechanism. Uh, support for multiple calendar systems is part of the API and, and uh, should needs to support sort of worldwide use of calendars. Um, and with a, a clock API, you've got control over time. So um, Stephen's been running this project for many years. <laughs> um, the project is, is very open. They're always looking for uh, help and contributions. And you know, please review and uh, the documents and, and contribute. Join the alias. Uh, there's a, a birds of a feather tonight. Uh, actually, it's right here at 7:30. Uh, so if you've got you know, if we can't answer your questions right now, come back and we can have a more uh, dynamic conversation. So, if there are questions, or Stephen, do you have any last comments? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing. Yeah, we, the whole point is it is open and you, you know, everybody can contribute and, you know, your feedback is always listened to. I think that's, that's the key thing, you know, there's, there's, there's no point in hiding away from people's experiences with date and time. So, whilst we've got some people in the audience, I'm going to ask you to stick up your hands. Before, before I get to questions, I'm going to get to questions, don't worry. Um, so, first question, I want you to put up your hand if you, in your business application, let's say in the last five years, um, have ever used dates before the year 1900. So, have you ever had to deal with dates before the year 1900? Okay, so we've got five, six. Do you want to quickly shout out what, what have been the primary use cases of those? You want to start down there? Okay, so really old companies, yeah. Policies that are old. Policies that are old, yeah. Birth dates. Birth dates, well, anybody older than <laughs> anybody older than that. But just birth dates or anything else? No, okay. Birth dates for people and companies. Yeah, uh, companies again, yeah. Birth dates, yeah. Birth dates for dead people. Yeah. Ah, birth <laughs> is that what you're thinking of? Birth no, you're thinking of just very old people, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool, that's fine. Um, so companies, policies, that's good, yeah. Good reasons, yeah. Um, and the second question we have is, how many of you, put up your hands, um, use a calendar system in your day-to-day -day coding in the last five years that is not the standard ISO calendar system that we're using in the Western world, Europe? So put up your hands if you're using a calendar system that is not the ISO calendar system in your applications. One, anybody else? Can you give us your, why you use that calendar system? Okay, yeah. And do you use that solely for displaying to humans or do you actually have to do calculations in the history calendar? Okay, thanks. Cool. Stephen, that's a very good question. We'll have to ask that one at the Java one in Japan and in Brazil. Yeah, yeah. So it's it, Thailand. And, and Thailand, and, yeah. And Thailand. Yeah. If if there's anybody from Japan or Thailand in here, can you please afterwards come and chat to us? Because we'd really like to know what your experience of dates and times are in those two particular countries, Thailand and Japan, because we, we know those are two of the countries where dates and times are more different than other countries. So now, we're ready for any questions <laughs> that you might have. Did you have a question? So the question is, what's the difference between the period class and the duration class? And this is an understandable conflict because they represent similar-ish types of things. They are both an amount of time. So a duration is an amount of time just measured in seconds and nanoseconds. So it's only on the instant timeline. Whereas a period is measured in terms of human scale time. So years, months, days, hour minutes, and seconds. So the astute amongst you will notice that seconds appears in both of those definitions. So you could therefore theoretically define duration as a period, just use the seconds field. Um, however, there's also a difference in terms of which timeline they associate with. So we talked up earlier about having local date, local time, local date time. So if you have a daylight savings time gap in spring, 
and you measure the period from midnight to 6 a.m. in the morning, you'll get a period of six hours, but you'll get a duration of five hours. So the duration is taking account of the timeline, the instant timeline, the one that actually, you know, the real timeline that occurs, whereas the period is only taking account of the what appears on the clock. You know, on the clock, we've gone from top of the clock to six o'clock. Therefore, that's six hours. So that's the difference between the two. Question over here. So the question is, is there a such a concept as business days within the application? Yeah, yeah. Working day, working days, that kind of thing, yeah. So there are companies out there which make money from selling you the information as to when holidays are. It, it's a complicated job keeping track of all the countries around the world and what days holidays occur in. It's more complicated than figuring out when time zones change. You know, governments make government makes even stranger decisions around when holidays are. So, you know, could we provide in the, in the JDK that information? It's not really practical to do so. However, what we can provide is 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 the ability for you to have somewhere where that code can be plugged in. So we talked about date time adjusters. So date time adjusters allow you to wrap that kind of holiday behavior. So if you have a library or a database in your application, which probably comes from some one of these commercial vendors or maybe from somewhere else, you have the right tool with the adjusters to be able to easily integrate that into the API. I mean, even weekends, believe it, you know, that varies around the world, you know. So, so on that, I mean, one of the databases that goes into support of the APIs is the CLDR database, where they've tried to, you know, create a big database of, for every region, concepts like what's, what, when does a week start, when are the weekends, and those things don't take into account holidays. Or this, they'll never tell you that Monday's a holiday, or you know, Germany has a bank holiday. So that really requires this extended database. But I think we can build in the notion of sort of the standard week concepts if it's drawn from the CLDR data, like the time zone data. We can't. We don't know that. You know, a priori, the time zone stuff is built on the Olson database and is plugged in, um, and the CLDR data. Uh, comes from is another source that we could expose through the API, but to really solve the problem, we need yeah, more, yeah, more commercial. Yeah, data. week week working days versus weekends is in the CLDR database. When holidays are, isn't. Right. So we might be able to do one, but not the other. Start is there, from there. Is there a flag like this work day already, or something that you can at least let the API tell you whatever the other like the date slope is. Not at the moment. Um, it's it's a, it's one of these nice to have features. We, we the data is available in CI, CLDR, but we've got other issues to tackle first. So I'm going to go white. Yes. Um, is there anything similar like intervals in Jota? Like uh, that doesn't sound like that in Jota. Like period. Like an actual no. duration of time bounded. For for reasons of scope, we don't have a an interval class. Um, you know, it doesn't prevent it from being added in a future JDK, but we don't have one at the moment. Yeah. Is there anybody? Yeah. Well, I have a plan. <laughs> um, my plan is that I hope to make Joda Time a new release of Joda Time, which implements the interfaces of the JDK. So the problem you have is the class names will clash. So there'll be a local date class in Joda Time. There'll be a local date class in the JDK. There's not much I can do about that. But you would be able to pass and interoperate the things between the two. But that's that's my plan. Um, obviously, that's you know down the road. But yeah. The idea is this is a JDK eight. Will it be the RINET prototype or a separate implementation? In terms of what I was talking about there, I was talking about adding interfaces to JDK to Joda Time that would then run only on JDK eight. I'm going to go there.
Yeah, I mean, the sources of uh, sort of, as you mentioned, politically or driven data are, are not going to change. Um, you know, when, Right. So actually, I don't know. There is a, a TZ updater, which is a separate application which applies the time zone database to multiple versions of the JDK. Uh, that doesn't actually mean that you have to replace the whole JDK. Maybe you did that for other updated for other reasons. But there is a tool that will insert new new time zone data into into the JDK, and that will still persist. We don't have any way to do that. I have heard of uh, essentially a a network based uh, source of Olson data, but I don't think at the moment we have any plan to qualify it and see whether how it should be hooked in, but I think it could be plugged in at some point in time. Yeah, I think what I'd say is that in the JSR on the current GitHub site, we actually have that information as a separate jar file. But when we integrate into OpenJDK, it's not clear exactly whether we'll be able to keep that. Well, so the, it, may, it may get locked back down again, if you see what I mean. I mean, in, so. the, in, the JD, in the current JDK, the time zone data is a separate file. It's, it, I forget what directory it's in, but it's a separate file. It's replaceable and updatable. And that, I don't see any way around that, given, it's, like you said, it's external data. <coughs> So the, so the questions about um, the size of the API in terms of modules and where the module might sit. Um, so there's still an element of discussion to be had around this. Um, you know, it's quite a low fundamental thing, date and time, and particularly if we make the existing Java Util date and Java Util calendar classes implement 310 interfaces. And obviously, some of those interfaces clearly have to be in the core because Java Util date and Java Util calendar are going to be in the core modules. So Figuring out the exact boundary of that, um, there are a couple of options there, but it's not a it's not a small API, the date and time stuff. I think I think as we've tried to go through it, you know, there's there's quite a lot of functionality and quite a lot of features which you kind of need if you're actually going to accurately deal with date and time. So you can certainly split out the calendar system jars because a multiple calendar <laughs> systems obviously plug in in a certain way. The question is whether we can spit out some of the other stuff, and that's an open question. Maybe come tonight if you want to explore that in a bit more detail. Did you want to say something there? Uh, no. Okay. Well, I'm going to go there. So the question is about TAI versus UTC and conversion between these two things. So about two years ago, um, we had a set of classes um, called TII instant, um, UTC instant, and instant. And these provided the conversion mechanisms between them in an accurate way. The problem is, the problem is <laughs> that A, UTC as it's currently defined may go away. So do we want to you know, this is under discussion at the moment. So if we put in classes into the JDK now that become redundant in a year's time, that doesn't really make much sense. Um, so it's a question of, well, you know, is this such a niche, TAI versus UTC, that it doesn't really matter? So in the end, the decision appears to be that we're going to leave out details of other timescales. Does that mean that, you know, yeah, the classes still exist. The classes are still in GitHub. They're in just a directory which basically says this bit's not being included in the JSR. Um, you know, can we then maybe publish those as a jar file on Maven? I'd hope so. You know, so if you're a scientist and you care about these things, why not? You know, you'd have to pick up an extra jar file from Maven, but it would integrate. So that's sort of the direction of, of travel, of thought, and hopefully that will be sufficient, shall we say. Do we have any more questions? Oh, yeah. 
So the, so the question is, you know, is there a point at which we can grab the API before it gets integrated into the JDK? And the, this is a, it, it's a hard question. It, it's unlikely there's going to be a fixed JSR definition before it gets into, integrated into the JDK. Now, in an ideal world where we all had ponies and multiple, you know, 48 hours in a day, we'd be able to produce some kind of backport version that was constantly kept up to date with what's in the JDK. Um, that seems unlikely at this point. Um, it's more important to focus on the actual main base of the code itself. Have you decided whether you're using Lambda? Like, you know, move the next yeah. Friday or the Monday? I mean, Roger mentioned the possible use of Lambdas. I have to say, I haven't seen anywhere where Lambdas really make sense in the API. Um, however, the date time adjuster interface is a single method interface. So you could theoretically use it for Lambdas, but I can't say I'd really see much use for using it for lambdas, but you probably could. <laughs> it's it's not that we're like anti lambda; it's just that it doesn't seem to fulfil any useful use cases. Any more questions? I think we're done. Okay, so don't forget to come along to the boff tonight if you've got more more input you want to give, and if you're Japanese or Thai, please come and see us now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.